morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to the APSA 2023 annual meeting. We are excited to be providing our second full hybrid meeting with 850 participants, both in person and virtually. It's an honor and a pleasure to see you all here at the 54th annual meeting of the American Pediatric Surgical Association. There's a great deal to anticipate in our program over the next four days. In fact, those of you who came early may already have participated in special pre-meeting sessions on ECMO simulation, gun violence, and coaching. We're looking forward to 171 abstracts, 18 plenary talks, 72 scientific presentations, and 75 quick shots which are oral posters. We are delighted to welcome 155 members to the new section of affiliated professionals. This group has already been hard at work deciding on its governance structure, electing its first set of leaders, and thinking collaboratively about committee work. Kudos to you all. We also recognize that this is National Nurses Week and welcome our nurse partners who are attending the meeting. We are particularly excited about this year's keynote speaker, a leader renowned for her expertise in addressing gun violence as a public health issue. We're excited about the first ever presidential symposium for young investigators and there will be breakout sessions on a multitude of topics. If it sounds as if this meeting is packed, it is. We're looking forward to a really rich experience for all. Lots of new knowledge, good questions, and food for collegial discussions. We're also pleased to continue the opportunity to include members who haven't always had a chance to join the annual meeting. After all, there's always a need um, for pediatric surgeons to stay at home to fulfill our professional obligations. We consider it a privilege to expand inclusion so that everyone can join virtually. All sessions in the main room are live streamed for our virtual audience. Even if you're here in person, you can lounge by the pool and watch the live stream wherever you are. We have chat managers watching for questions through the app, in addition to our live audience questions in the meeting room. Even though the breakout sessions are not live streamed, all content in the main room and breakout rooms is recorded and available on demand to all registrants for one year. Please also take some time to visit with our industry partners in the sold out exhibit hall. This sponsorship is so critical to our meaning support and has set a new record this year. Your interest in and engagement with these partners means a lot to them and will establish a connection for future support. In addition, this year we are pleased to offer a variety of mentorship opportunities for general surgery residents who are interested in pediatric surgery. The first event is a speed mentoring lunch today during the lunch break. Pre-registration was required. And also, this year you may have heard we are expanding our special interest groups, or SIGs, and we encourage you to check out the SIG open house during every breakfast and lunch break in Regency Hall. This is an opportunity to connect to other members who may share a practice focus with you. The SIG leaders will be around to gather a list of names that can be used to connect in between meetings. The APSA Foundation is holding a silent auction for the duration of the meeting. Go to your app and from the home page, click on the auction button. Browse the items and start bidding. Please help the foundation raise funds to continue supporting important research and educational projects. Bids will be accepted until noon on Sunday. Good luck. And 
we look forward to seeing all of you tonight at the welcome reception, which is generously sponsored by Nemours Children's Health. We are really excited to reconnect with all of you tonight. By now, you should have downloaded the Whova app. If you need assistance, please ask at the APSA registration desk. The app will provide you with the full agenda, important announcements and updates, a virtual poster hall, a virtual exhibit hall, speaker and attendee engagement opportunities, and access for claiming your CME at the conclusion of the meeting. Again, a reminder that all sessions in the main room are live streamed. All sessions are recorded and will be available on demand after the meeting. We will now dive in to our first set of scientific abstracts representing some of the highest scoring submissions for this year. All abstracts were reviewed by up to 40 APSA members from a number of committees. I'd like to introduce our first set of moderators. Dr. Megan Arnold is Clinical Associate Professor at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. Dr. Alejandro Garcia um, is Assistant Professor of Surgery at Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore, Maryland. And Dr. Gwyneth Sullivan is a resident at Rush University Medical Center and a research fellow at Robert H. Lurie Children's Hospital in Chicago. Good morning, everybody. We have strict instructions to stay on time, so we're going to do our best. Each of the abstracts will be presented for five minutes with three minutes available for questions. We ask that you come to the microphones and as we recognize you and you ask your question that you identify your name and your institution. Without further ado, we're going to get started and the first abstract is the State of Gender Equity in Pediatric Surgery, a report from the Benji Brooks Committee of the American Pediatric Surgical Association to be presented by Dr. Megan Vu. Good morning and thank you. I'm honored to present on behalf of our committee today uh, there are several Benji Brooks events this week, including uh, operating room ergonomics later this afternoon, as well as the annual Benji Brooks luncheon this Friday. Um, everyone, uh, men and women, are welcome. I have no disclosures. Um, the Benji Brooks luncheon was initially organized uh, discreetly without the support of APSA for many years. This changed after an incredible meeting in Palm Desert, California, after which the Board of Governors approved the Benji Brooks Committee. Soon after its inception, Dr. Fallot and Dr. Farmer were asked a simple question. How many women pediatric surgeons are professors? We realized that we did not know the answer to this simple question, leading to one of the first major projects of the committee. In 2004, Dr. Caniano surveyed 75 women pediatric surgeons. We wanted to see how things have changed nearly two decades later, this time including both men and women in the study. Have obstacles changed for women? Do the obstacles differ for men in pediatric surgery? Uh, in March 2022, we uh, deployed the survey over a two-week period um, covering several different topics, including advancement in career satisfaction, family and child care issues. We had 315 respondents. 57% of respondents identified as women, and there were no respondents who identified as non-binary. Most respondents worked in academic practice, and the respondents represented people all across North America, including 25% from the Southeast, 21% from the West, 19% from the Northeast, 17% from the Midwest, 12% from Southwest, as well as 5% in Canada. The range of graduates um, extended quite far from 1969 to 2021. Moving on to the section on advancement and career, women surgeons were notably made up a larger proportion of assistant professors, while men represented more full professors. Looking at the median salary, most pediatric surgeons with salaries above the median were men, while the majority of those below the median were women. This could be reflective of the differences in academic rank. Notably, of those with academic appointments, 25% of women were tenure-track compared to 30% of men. 
Overall, surgeons shared that the leading barrier to promotion was insufficient protected time. When analyzed for gender differences, women had statistically significant higher prevalence of reporting barriers due to lack of mentorship, inadequate administrative support, excessive on-call commitments, and lack of departmental chair support. In the section on family and child care issues, more female surgeons uh, take primary responsibility for household tasks compared to men, while more male surgeons' spouses take primary responsibility compared to women surgeons' spouses. 15% of women surgeons serve as the primary child care provider compared to 1% of men. This is reflected as well with 11% of women surgeons uh, versus 20% of male surgeons' spouses, as well as a very high rate of 15% for women surgeons versus 5% of male surgeons who uh, required a hired employee as the major child care provider. Most surgeons in our cohort waited until completion of training to become pregnant. 38% of respondents have been pregnant, and women surgeons oft, more often waited until research or completion of training to become pregnant. Uh, most surgeons who did take leave took less than two weeks, and in fact, 90% of, um, of our, our respondents um, took less than the uh, recommended 14 weeks as recommended by the United Nations Agency, the International Labor Organization. Overall, the uplifting note is that 92% of surgeons express career satisfaction. They would choose a career in pediatric surgery again. Though we did not find statistical significance, it was interesting to find that 10% of women would not choose a career in pediatric sur surgery compared to only 4% of men. So in conclusion, overall uplifting that 92% of surgeons would still choose a career in pediatric, pediatric surgery. Um, in looking at both men and women, perceived barriers to career advancement and limited parental leave are shared issues among men and women, and gender equities still exist. Thank you. This abstract is open for discussion. If there are any questions. I'll give one. Um, so one of the most significant differences that we saw was the perceived lack of mentorship. Um, and so I'm curious how, if you have ideas or from the committee on how to optimize this and how do we make this disparity uh, smaller? I think um, we already have some great programs through APSA. Um, I, I know the coaching sessions have been very big, but coaching, again, is very different from mentoring. We didn't ask any specific questions about coaching, which would be interesting for a future study to kind of look into that. But I believe that coaches, mentors, um, senior and junior colleagues, having that network of people to help support you as you go through your uh, career are very vital um, to moving, moving forward professionally. Um, so I think, I think all of those areas together um, can be worked on. Excellent. All right, if there aren't any other questions, we'll move on. Thank you very much. Thank you.